The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, in that case, let's get going. Uh, in today's lecture, we're going to be sort of splitting the lecture if, things, if the timing goes as I plan. Uh, we're going to start by uh, finishing talking about the geodesic equation, uh, and then if all goes well, we will start talking about uh, the energy of radiation, completely changing topics altogether. Uh, I want to begin, uh, as usual, by reviewing quickly what we talked about last time, just to remind us where we are. Uh, last time we had first, uh, at the beginning of the lecture, uh, talked about how to add time into the Robertson-Walker metric. And this is the formula that we claimed was the correct one. Uh, for a space-time metric, uh, ds squared, uh, the meaning is closely analogous to the meaning that it would have in special relativity. Uh, the main difference being that in special relativity, we always talk about what is uh, observed by inertial uh, frames of reference and inertial observers. Uh, in general relativity, the concept of an inertial observer is not so clear cut. Uh, but we can talk about observers for whom there is no forces acting on them other than possibly gravitational forces. And whether or not there are gravitational forces is always a, itself a frame-dependent question. So it does not have a definite answer. Uh, so observers for which there's no forces acting on them other than gravitational forces are called free-falling observers. Uh, and they play the role of inertial observers that uh, the inertial observers play in special relativity. Uh, so if ds squared is positive, it's the square of the spatial separation uh, measured by a local free-falling observer for whom the two events happen at the same time. Uh, last time, I think I did not really mention or emphasize the word local. Uh, but the point is that in general relativity, we expect in any small region, one can construct an accelerating coordinate system in which the effects of gravity are canceled out, uh, as the equivalence principle tells us we can do. And then you essentially see the effects of special relativity. But it's only in a small region, in principle in an infinitesimal region. Uh, so these measurements that correspond to special relativity measurements uh, are always made uh, locally uh, by an observer who's in principle arbitrarily close to the events being measured. Uh, if ds squared is negative, then it's equal to minus c, c squared times the square of the time separation uh, that would be measured by a local free-falling observer for whom the two events happen at the same location. Uh, I should point out that a special case of this uh, is an observer looking at his own wristwatch. His own wristwatch is always at the same location relative to him. So it's a special case of this uh, statement. Uh, so it says that ds squared is equal to minus c squared times the time that you, an initially, that a free-falling observer would read on his own wristwatch. Uh, and if ds squared is 0, it means that the two events can be joined by a light pulse going from one to the other. Uh, having said this, we can go back to this formula and understand why the formula is what it is. Uh, the spatial part is what it is because any homogeneous and isotropic spatial metric can be written in this form. Uh, and we are assuming that the universe we're describing is homogeneous and isotropic. The dc squared piece is really dictated by item two here. Uh, we want the t that we write in this metric to be the cosmic time variable that we've been speaking about. And that means that it is the time variable measured on the watches of observers who are at rest in this coordinate system. And that means that it has to be simply minus c squared dt squared, or else dt would not have the right relationship to ds squared to be consistent uh, with what ds squared is supposed to mean. Uh, and then we also talked about why there are no dt dr terms, or dt d theta, or dt d phi. Uh, we said that any such term would violate isotropy. Uh, if you had a dt dr term, for example, it would make the positive dr direction different from the negative dr direction. And that can't be something that happens in an isotropic universe. Uh, so that then is our metric for cosmology, the Robertson-Walker metric. Uh, another important thing is, what is it good for? Now that we decided that's the right metric, what, 
what uses it to us. And it, it, what we haven't done yet, but it's actually on the homework, uh, we need the full space-time metric to be able to find geodesics, to be able to learn the paths of particles uh, moving through uh, this model universe. So we will be making important use of this Robertson-Walker metric with its space-time uh, contributions. OK, any questions about that? Now I'm ready to change gear to some extent. Yes, Ani. Um, so in general, do you get, so the spatial part of the metric do we, we can get from the geometry. And in general, can you just add a minus c squared to t squared for the te temporal part? Uh, it's not quite general. Remember, we used an argument based on isotropy here. Uh, uh, so um, I think it's safe to say that any metric you'll find in this class is likely to have the time entering and nothing more complicated than minus c squared dt squared. Uh, but it's not a general statement about general relativity. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, well, uh, okay, the question is what uh, would be a circumstance where we would have to deal with something more complicated? Uh, the answer would be, I think, uh, all you need is to uh, add to this model universe uh, perturbations that break the uniformity. If we tried to describe the real universe instead of this ideal universe, where our ideal universe is perfectly isotropic and homogeneous, if instead we wanted to describe the lumps and bumps of the real universe, uh, then it would become more complicated, and we would probably need a dt dr term. OK, next we went on to talking about the geodesic equation. Uh, according to general relativity, the trajectories of particles uh, that have no forces acting on them other than gravity, these free-falling observers, uh, are geodesics in the space-time. Uh, so that means we want to learn how to calculate geodesics, which means paths whose length is stationary under small variations. Uh, so we considered first just simple geodesics in a spatial metric, because that's easier to think about. What is the shortest distance between two points in a space that's described by some arbitrary metric? Uh, so first we talked about how to describe the metric, and we introduced two features in this first formula here. Uh, one is that instead of calling the coordinates x, y, z, or something like that, we call them x1, x2, x3, so that we could talk about them all together in one formula without writing separate pieces for the different coordinates. Uh, so i and j represent uh, 1, 2, and 3, or just 1 and 2, uh, which is the labeling of the spatial coordinates. Uh, and the other important piece of notation that is introduced in that formula is the Einstein summation convention. Uh, whenever there's an index like i and j here, which are repeated with one index lower and one index upper, they are automatically summed over all of the values that the coordinates take without writing a, a summation sign. Uh, it saves a lot of writing, and it turns out that one always sums in, under those circumstances. So there's no need to write the, sums, the summation sign. Okay, next we wanted to ask ourselves, how, how are we going to describe a path? Before we can find the minimum path, we need at least a language to talk about paths. Um, and we can describe a path going from some point A to some point B by giving a function x super i of lambda, where lambda is an arbitrary parameter that parameterizes the path. Uh, x super i are a set of coordinates. i runs over the values of all the coordinates of whatever system you're dealing with. Uh, and you construct such a function where xi of 0 is the starting point, which are the coordinates of the point A, and xi of some value lambda f, where f just stands for final, uh, will be the end of the path, and it's supposed to end at point B. So the final coordinates of the path should be x super i sub b, the coordinates of the point B. Uh, then we want to use this description of the path to figure out what the length is of a segment of the path, and then the full length will be the sum of the segments. So for each segment, we just apply the metric uh, to the change in coordinates. The change in coordinates, as lambda is varied, is just the derivative of xi with respect to lambda times the change in lambda. Uh, 
Uh, and putting that in for both uh, dxi and dxj, uh, one gets this formula, relating ds squared, the square of the length of an infinitesimal segment, uh, to d lambda squared, the square of the parameter that describes that length. Uh, then the full length is gotten by, first of all, taking the square root of this equation to get the infinitesimal length ds, uh, and then taking the integral of that uh, over the path from beginning to end. And that then gives us the full length of the path, thinking of it as the sum of the lengths of each infinitesimal segment. OK, clear enough? Now that we have this formula for the length, now we have the next challenge, which is to figure out how to calculate the path which minimizes that length. And I didn't use the word last time, but that is what's called the calculus of variations. And I looked up a little bit of the history in the Wikipedia. Uh, the calculus of variations dates back to 1696, uh, when Johann Bernoulli invented it, applied it to the brachistochrome problem, which is the problem of finding a path uh, for which a frictionless object will slide and get to its destination in the least possible time. Uh, it turns out to be a cycloid, just like the cycloid that describes our closed universes, uh, closed matter-dominated universe. Um, and the problem was also solved by uh, Johann uh, uh, Bernoulli then announced this problem to the world and challenged other mathematicians to solve it. Uh, there's a famous story that Newton uh, noticed this question in his mail when he got home at 4 a.m. or something like that from the Mint. He was apparently a hardworking guy. Uh, but nonetheless, he, having seen this problem, he couldn't go to bed. He went ahead and solved it by morning, uh, <laughs> which is a good MIT student kind of thing to do. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, the technique is to consider a small variation from whatever path you're hoping to be the minimum. And we're going to calculate the first order change in the length of the path, uh, starting from our original path, x of lambda, to some new path, x tilde of lambda. And we parameterize the new path uh, by writing it as the old path plus a correction. And I've introduced a factor alpha multiplying the correction because it makes it easier to talk about derivatives. Uh, and wi of lambda is just some arbitrary deviation from the original path. Uh, but we want to always go from the same starting point to the same endpoint because there's never going to be a minimum if we're allowed to move the endpoints. Uh, so the endpoints are fixed. And that means that this path deviation, w super i in my notation, uh, has to vanish at the two endpoints. So we impose these two equations on the variation wi. Uh, then uh, what we want to do is take the derivative of the path length of the varied path, x tilde, with respect to alpha. And if we had a minimum length to start with, uh, the derivative should always vanish. That is, the minimum should always occur when alpha equals 0 if the original path is the true path, the true minimum path. Uh, and if alpha equals 0 is the minimum, the derivative should always vanish at alpha equals 0. And vice versa. If we know that this happens for every variation wi, then we know that our path is at least an extremum and presumably a minimum. Uh, and the path itself is just written by the same formula as we had before, except for x tilde instead of x itself. And I've introduced an auxiliary quantity a of lambda alpha which is just what appears inside the square root. Uh, just say some writing, because it has to be written a number of times in the course of the manipulations. Uh, so our goal now is to carry out this derivative. And the derivative acts only on the integrand, because the limits of integration do not depend on alpha. So we just carry the, the derivative into the integrand and differentiate this square root of a of lambda, which is itself a product of factors that we have to use product rule and chain rule and various manipulations. And after we carry out those manipulations, uh, we end up with this expression in a straightforward uh, way involving a few steps, which I won't show again. Uh, and the complication is that what we want to do is to figure out uh, for what paths uh, that expression will vanish for all wi. We want it to vanish for all possible variations of the path. And what's complicated 
uh, is that wi appears here as a multiplicative factor in the first term, uh, but as a differentiated factor in the second term. And that makes it very hard to know initially uh, when those two terms might cancel each other to give you 0, which is what we're looking for. Uh, but the brilliant trick that I guess Newton invented, along with Bernoulli and others, uh, is to integrate by parts. Uh, integration by parts, I'm sure, was not a well-known procedure at that time. Uh, but if we integrate the second term by parts, we can remove the derivative acting on w and arrange for w to be a multiplicative factor in both terms. Uh, and a crucial thing that makes the whole thing uh, useful is that when you do integrate by parts, uh, you discover that you don't get any endpoint contributions uh, because the endpoint contributions would be proportional to wi at the endpoints. And remember, wi has to vanish at the endpoints because that's the condition uh, that we're not changing the points a and b. We're always talking about paths that have the same starting point and the same ending point. Uh, so uh, integrating by parts, uh, we get this expression, where now wi multiplies everything as just simply a multiplicative factor. To write it in this form, we had to do a little bit of juggling of indices. The other important trick in these manipulations is to juggle indices, which I'm not showing you explicitly. But the thing to remember is that these indices that are being summed over can be called anything, and it's still the same sum. Uh, so when you want to get terms to cancel each other, you may have to change the names of indices to get them to just cancel identically. Uh, but that's straightforward. Uh, so we get this expression. Uh, and now we want this expression to vanish for every possible wi of lambda. And we argued that the only way it could vanish for every possible wi of lambda is if the expression in curly brackets itself vanishes. Yeah, if we only knew that it vanished for some particular wi of lambda, then there are lots of ways it could vanish, because it could be positive in some places and negative in others. Uh, but the only way it could vanish for all wi is for the quantity in curly brackets to vanish. Uh, so that gives us our final or at least almost final expression for the geodesic equation. And that's where we left off last time uh, with that equation. Uh, so note that this is just an equation that would either be obeyed or not obeyed by the function x super i of lambda. It's just a differential equation involving uh, x super i of lambda and the metric, which we assume is given. OK, so are there any questions about that? Everybody happy? Great. OK, now we'll continue on the blackboard. OK, the first thing I want to do is to simplify the equation a bit. Uh, this equation is fairly complicated because of those square roots of a's and the denominators. Square root of a is a pretty complicated thing to start with. And the square root of a here is even being differentiated with respect to lambda, making an incredible mess if you want to expand all that. Uh, so it would be nice to simplify that. And we do have one trick, uh, which we can still do, which we haven't done yet. Uh, we originally constructed our path, xi of lambda, as a function of some arbitrary parameter, lambda. Lambda just measures arbitrary points along the path. Uh, there are many, many ways to do that, an infinite number of ways that you can do that. Uh, and this formula will work for all of them. It's completely general. The formula, when we derived it, we didn't make any assumptions about how lambda was chosen. Uh, but we can simplify the formula by making a particular choice for lambda. And the choice that simplifies things is to choose lambda to be the arc length itself. Lambda should be the distance along the path. And then we're trying to express xi uh, as a function of how far you've already gone. Uh, and that has the effect, uh, if we go back to what ai was, oops, uh, a of lambda really is just uh, the path length uh, per lambda. So if lambda is the path length itself, uh, a is just equal to 1. I wonder if there's a formula that shows that more clearly. Here, if one remembers that this quantity is a, this tells us that ds squared is equal to a times d lambda squared. So if ds 
is the same as d lambda, if you've chosen your parameter to be the path length, this formula makes it clear that that's equivalent to setting a equal to 1. Uh, so going back to the formula, if a is 1, we could just drop it from all these, from both sides of the equation. And all that really matters, I should point out here, maybe because we'll be using it later, is that a is a constant. As long as a is a constant, uh, it will not be differentiated, and then it will cancel on the left side and the right side. So we don't necessarily care that it's 1, but we do care that it's a constant. And then it just disappears from the formula. Uh, and then we get the simpler formula. And now we will continue on the blackboard. Uh, the simpler formula is just DDS of gij dxj ds is equal to 1 half times the derivative of g j k with respect to xi times dxj ds dx k ds, where s is equal to the path length. So I've replaced lambda by s because we've set lambda equal to s. And s has a more specific meaning than lambda did. Lambda was a completely arbitrary parameterization of the path. So this formula deserves a big box. It really is the final formula for geodesics. One could write it in terms of different letters, we will later, but this actually is the formula. Uh, now, I should mention, just largely for the sake of uh, your knowing what's going on, if you ever look at some other general relativity books, uh, this is not the form that the geodesic equation is usually written in. Uh, frankly, it is the best form. If you want to find the geodesic, usually this form of writing the equation is the easiest. Uh, but most general relativity books prefer instead to just give a formula for the second derivative here, which involves just expanding this term and then one reshuffles things to try to simplify the expressions. Uh, so one can write, to start, DDS of GIJ DXJ DS we're just going to expand it. Now we're going to be making use of all the rules of calculus that we've learned. Every rule you've ever learned will probably get used in this calculation. Um, so it's a, we'll be using product rule, of course, because we have a product of two things here. Uh, but we also have the complication that gij is not explicitly a function of s. But gij is a function of position. And the position that one is at for any given value of s depends on s. because we're moving along the path x super i of s. So the gij here is evaluated uh, at x super i of s. Or I should give this a new letter, x super k of s. So it depends on s uh, through the argument of its argument. Uh, so that's a chain rule situation. Uh, and what we get here is, from just differentiating the second factor, that's easy. We get gij dx d squared xj ds squared. And then, from the derivative of the derivative chain rule piece, we get the partial of gij with respect to xk times dxj ds times dxk ds. And then to continue, uh, this piece gets brought over to the other side because we're trying to get an equation just for the second derivative of the path. 
then we get g sub ij d squared x super j ds squared is equal to 1 half di, I'll define that in a second, g sub jk minus 2 dk gij dx i d s dx j d s where this partial derivative with the subscript is just an abbreviation for the derivative with respect to the coordinate with that index. So that's just a, an abbreviation. OK, now uh, we have, you could think of this as a matrix times a vector is equal to an expression. What we'd like to do is just get an expression for this vector. So if we think of it as a matrix times a vector, uh, all we have to do is invert the matrix to be able to get an expression for the vector itself. Yes? Should I, or could you please be, um, Oh, yeah, I think you're right. I probably, it doesn't look right. Um, Thank you. Yeah, this has to multiply everything. Whoops. <laughs> OK, OK. Give it enough chances, I'll get it right. OK, OK. Everybody happy this time? Thank you very much for getting it straight. OK, so as I was saying, uh, we want to isolate the se second derivative. We're hoping to get just an expression for the second derivative. Uh, and this can be interpreted as a matrix times a vector equals something. We want to just invert that matrix. Yes? Oh, do I have that wrong too, perhaps? Uh, Yeah, I think we want J and K there, don't we? OK, attempt number four. <laughs> or did I lose count as well? J and K are the indices. Uh, and the I matches the I, free I on the left. And all the other indices are summed. So I think probably I finally achieved the right formula. Thanks for all the help. OK, so um, inverting a matrix is, you know, in principle, a straightforward mathematical operation. Um, in general relativity, we give a name to the inverse metric. Uh, and it's the same letter G, but with the indices written as superscripts instead of subscripts. And that's defined to be the matrix inverse. So G super IJ is defined to be the matrix inverse. of g sub ij. And to put that into an equation, uh, we could say that if we take g with upper indices, and I'll write those upper indices as i, time, I and l, and multiply it by a g with lower indices, l and j, uh, when you sum over adjacent indices uh, in this index notation, that's exactly what corresponds to the definition of matrix multiplication. Uh, so this is just the matrix G with upper indices times the matrix G with lower indices, and it's the ijth element of that matrix. And we're saying it should be the identity matrix, and that means that the ijth element should be 0 if it's off diagonal, and 1 if it's diagonal, if i equals j. And that's exactly the definition of the Kronecker delta so this is equal to delta ij. We remember that delta ij is 0 if i is not equal to j, 1 if i is equal to j. That's the definition. And it corresponds to the identity matrix in matrix language. <laughs>
So this is the relationship that actually defines G super IL. And it is just the statement that G with upper indices is the matrix inverse of G with lower indices. Uh, using this, we can bring this G to the other side, essentially by multiplying by G inverse. And I will save a little time by not writing that out in gory detail. But rather, I'll just write the result. And the result is written in terms of a new symbol that gets defined, which is an absolutely standard symbol in general relativity. Uh, the formula is d squared xi ds squared is equal to, uh, we know it's going to be equal to stuff times the product of two derivatives. Uh, and the stuff that appears is just given a name, capital gamma, which has an upper index i, which matches the left-hand side of the equation, and two lower indices, which I'm calling j and k, which will get summed with the derivatives that follow, dxj ds, dxk ds. And this quantity, gamma super i sub jk, are just the terms that would appear when we do these manipulations, and I'll write what they are. Gamma super i sub jk is equal to 1 half g super i l times the derivative with respect to j of g sub l k plus the derivative with respect to k of g sub lj, and then minus the derivative with respect to l of g sub jk. And this quantity is, has several different names. Everybody agrees how to define it up to a sign. There are different sign conventions that are used in different books. Uh, and uh, there are also different names for it. It's often called the affine connection. If you look, for example, in Steve Weinberg's general relativity book, he calls it the affine connection. Uh, it's also very often called the Christoffel connection or the Christoffel symbol. And frankly, those are the only names for it that I've seen personally. Uh, but there's a book about general relativity by Sean Carroll, which is a very good book. Uh, and he claims that uh, it's sometimes also called the Riemann connection. And it's also sometimes called the Levitchevity connection. Uh, so it's got lots of names, which I guess means lots of people independently invented it. But in any case, that's the answer. And it's just a way of rewriting the formula we have up there. And for solving problems, the formula, the way we wrote it up there, is almost always the best way to do it. So this is really just window dressing, largely for the purpose of making contact with other books that you might come across. OK, so that finishes the derivation of the geodesic equation. Now I'd like to give, some, to give an example of its use. Uh, but before I do that, let me just pause to ask if there are any questions about the derivation. OK, so on your homework, you will, in fact, be applying this formalism uh, to the Robertson-Walker metric. And you'll learn how moving particles slow down as they move through uh, an expanding universe, uh, completely in analogy to the way photons, uh, which we've already learned, uh, lose energy as they travel through an expanding universe. Uh, so particles with mass uh, also lose energy. Uh, in a well-defined way, which you'll be calculating on the homework. Uh, for an example, though, uh, I'll do something different. Uh, a fun metric to talk about is the Schwarzschild metric, uh, which describes, among other things, black holes. Uh, 
Uh, it, in principle, describes anything which is spherically symmetric and has a gravitational field. Uh, but black holes are the most interesting example because it, it's where the most surprises lie. So the Schwarzschild metric. has the form ds squared is equal to minus c squared d tau squared, uh, which is equal to, this is just a definition, defines d tau. Uh, but in terms of the coordinates, it's minus 1 minus 2 g Newton's constant m, the mass of the object we're discussing, the mass of the black hole, if it is a black hole divided by r times c squared. r is the radial coordinate uh, times c squared dt squared. Plus 1 minus 2 gm over r c squared times dr squared plus r squared times d theta squared plus sine squared theta d phi squared. Now here, theta and phi are the usual polar angles. We're using a polar coordinate system. Uh, so as usual, uh, theta lies between 0 and pi. 0 are what we might call the North Pole, and pi are what we might call the South Pole. Uh, and phi is what's often called an azimuthal angle. Uh, goes around, uh, and the way one describes coordinates on the surface of the Earth, phi would be the uh, longitude variable. So 0 is less than or equal to phi is less than or equal to 2 pi, uh, where phi equals 2 pi is identified with phi equals 0. When you go around, you come back to where you started. Now notice that if we set capital M, the mass of this object, equal to 0, the metric becomes the, the trivial metric of special relativity written in spherical polar coordinates. Uh, so all complications go away if there's no mass. The, object disappears. Uh, but as long as the mass is non-zero, there are factors that multiply the dr squared term and the c squared dt squared term. Notice that the factors that do that multiplying, uh, one of these should be inverted. I important minus inverse to minus one power for that factor. Um, Notice that r can be big enough, uh, or small enough, I should say, uh, so that these factors vanish. Uh, and the place where that happens is called the Schwarzschild radius, after the same person who invented the metric. So r sub Schwarzschild is equal to 2gm divided by c squared. When little r is equal to that, uh, this quantity in parentheses vanishes, which means that we get an infinity here because it's inverted, and we get a zero there. Uh, uh, now, when a term in the metric is either zero or infinite, uh, one calls that a, a singularity. Uh, in this case, it's a removable singularity. Uh, that is, the Schwarzschild singularity is only there because Schwarzschild chose to use these particular coordinates. Uh, these are simpler than other coordinates, so he wasn't foolish to use them. Uh, but the appearance of that singularity is really caused solely by the choice of coordinates. There really is no singularity at the Schwarzschild uh, horizon. Um, and that was shown some years later by other people uh, constructing other coordinate systems. Uh, the coordinate system that's best known today uh, that avoids the Schwarzschild singularity is a coordinate system called the Kruskal coordinate system. 
uh, but we will not be looking at the classical coordinate system in this class. Leave that for the GR class. That you'll take some time. OK, now, um, the mass is some parameter. Notice that the metric is completely determined by the mass. And that's the same situation as we found in Newtonian gravity. Uh, the metric outside of a spherically symmetric object, uh, rather the gravitational field in Newtonian physics outside of a spherically symmetric object, depends only on the total mass. It does not depend at all on how it's distributed as long as it's spherically symmetric. And same thing here. Uh, as long as an object is spherically symmetric, the gravitational field outside of the object will always look like that formula. Uh, now, there are still two cases. Uh, outside of the object could be larger than or smaller than the Schwarzschild radius. Uh, so for an object like the sun, the Schwarzschild radius, we could calculate it. Uh, and it's calculated in the notes. It's about two or three kilometers. Hold on, and I'll tell you more accurately. It's 2.95 kilometers, the Schwarzschild radius of the, of the sun. Uh, but the sun, of course, is much bigger than that. And that means that the sun doesn't have a Schwarzschild horizon. Uh, that is, at 2.95 kilometers from the center of the sun, uh, there's still sun. Uh, it's not outside the sun. This metric only holds outside the spherical symmetric object. Uh, so it does not hold inside the sun. The place where this has the uh, apparent singularity, uh, the metric is not valid at all. So there's nothing that even comes close to um, being worth talking about as far as the Schwarzschild singularity for an object like the sun. But if the sun were compressed to a size smaller than 2.95 uh, kilometers with the same mass, uh, then uh, these factors would be relevant at the places where they vanish. And whatever consequences they have, we would be dealing with. Uh, even though r equals r Schwarzschild is not a singular point, it is still a special point. Uh, what you can show, we won't, but what, what one can show is that that is the horizon, meaning that if an object falls inside the Schwarzschild radius, uh, there is no trajectory that will ever get it out. Yes? Say a star is just like incredibly dense at its core. Is it possible to have like suppression of some fraction of the light of the star that's like from that mass that is contained, or like the fusion reaction going on within that radius? Uh, OK, could there be a horizon inside of a star? I think is what you're asking, basically. So one that actually affects the. One that really is a horizon. Right, not, not just uh, if, if this were the sun we were describing. This formula would just not be valid inside. There would be no horizon inside. But you're asking a, real, a valid question. Uh, if a star had, for some reason, a very dense spot in the middle, uh, could it actually form a horizon inside the material? Uh, and the answer is yes, it could. It would not be stable. The material would ultimately fall in. Um, so, uh, but, but it could happen. Yes? That's right. Our galaxy does have a supermassive black hole in the center. Yeah, so you can consider that as like a large mass that has a black hole area. Right. Right. That's right. The, the, the comment is that uh, if we go from a star to something bigger than a star, we have a perfectly good example uh, in our own galaxy where there's a black hole in the center, but there's still mass that continues outside of that. And the black hole is accreting. More matter is, does keep falling in. It's not really stable. Uh, but uh, it certainly does exist and can exist. Any other questions? OK, well, our goal now is to calculate a geodesic and uh, I will just calculate one geodesic. I will calculate what happens if an object starts at some fixed radius at rest and is released and falls into this black hole. OK, I first want to just rewrite the geodesic equation in terms of variables that are more appropriate for this case. 
Uh, when I wrote that, I had a mind just calculating geodesics in space, looking for the shortest path between two points. Uh, the geodesic that we're talking about when we're talking about an object uh, in general relativity moving along a geodesic is a geodesic that's a time-like geodesic. Uh, that is, any increment along the geodesic is a time-like interval following a particle. Particles travel on time-like trajectories in relativity. Um, so uh, the usual notation for time is something like ta rather than s, which is why I wrote it this way. ds squared is just defined to be minus d squared d ta squared. So d ta squared has no more nor less information than ds squared, but it has the opposite sign and differs by a factor of c squared as well. Uh, and another change in notation, which is a rather universal convention, is that when we talk about space alone, we use Latin indices, i, j, k. Uh, when we talk about space-time, where one of the indices might be zero, referring to the time direction, uh, then we usually use Greek indices, mu, nu, lambda. Uh, so uh, I'm going to rewrite the geodesic equation using ta as my parameter instead of s, because we're talking about proper time along the trajectory instead of distances, and using Greek letters instead of Latin letters, because we're talking about space-time rather than just space. So otherwise, one of the right is just identical to that. So it really is nothing more than a change in notation. Uh, d d ta of g mu nu dx super nu d ta is equal to 1 half times the partial of g lambda sigma with respect to x mu dx lambda d ta dx sigma d ta. Now you might want to go through the calculation and make sure the fact that uh, now we're dealing with a metric which is not positive definite uh, doesn't make any difference, but it doesn't. Uh, it does mean that now we certainly have possibilities of getting maxima and stationary points as well as minima. Um, because of the variety of signs that appear in the metric. Uh, but otherwise, the calculation of the geodesic equation goes through exactly as we calculated it. And the only thing I'm doing here, relative to what we have there, is just changing the notation a bit to conform to the notation that's usually used for talking about space-time trajectories. OK, since we're talking about radial trajectories, we're just going to release a particle at rest, and then it will fall straight towards the center of our spherical object. Um, we know by symmetry that it's not going to be deflected in the positive theta or the negative theta or the positive phi or negative phi directions, because that would violate isotropy. It would violate the rotational symmetry that we know is part of this metric. This is just the metric of the surface of a sphere. Uh, so theta and phi will just stay whatever values they have when you drop this object. So we will not even talk about theta and phi. We'll only talk about r and t, how the particle falls in as a function of time. Uh, and then we can, it turns out to be useful to just first write down what the metric itself tells us. And we're going to divide by d tau so we can talk about derivatives with respect to tau. Uh, so changing an overall sign, since everything's going to be negative, we'd rather have everything be positive. Uh, we can just rewrite the metric equation as saying that c squared is equal to 1 minus 2gm over r c squared times c squared times dt d ta squared minus 1 minus 2gm over r c squared inverse times dr d ta squared. Okay. So this is nothing more than a rewriting of this equation, setting d theta equal to 0 and d phi equal to 0. Uh, 
Uh, written this way, though, it tells us that we can find dt d tau, for example, uh, if we know dr d tau. And we also know where we are, you know, little r. And we'll be using that shortly. Uh, to continue a little further, we're going to introduce some abbreviations just so we don't have to write so much. Uh, I'm going to find little h of r as just 1 minus uh, r Schwarzschild over r. And this is also 1 minus 2gm over rc squared. It's a factor that keeps recurring in our expression for the metric. Yes? Um, probably. Yes, thank you. C squared. Right. Thanks a lot. And in terms of h of r, we can rewrite that equation uh, slightly more simply. Uh, I'm going to bring things to the other side and write it as c squared times dt d tau squared is equal to c squared h inverse of r plus h to the minus 2 of r times dr d tau squared. This is just a rewriting of the above equation, making use of the new notation that we've introduced. And this is the form we'll be using it. It explicitly tells us how to find dt d tau in terms of other things. So dt d tau is not independent. Since we know dt d tau in terms of dr d tau, if we get an expression for dr d tau, we're sort of finished. Uh, we can find everything we want to know about t uh, from the equation we just wrote. Uh, so it turns out that all we need to do to calculate this radial trajectory is to look at the component of the metric where that free index mu, mu is the index that's not summed, uh, we're going to set mu equal to r. And remember, mu is a number that corresponds to a coordinate. And we're going to set mu equal to the value that corresponds to the r coordinate. And that, and that will be sufficient uh, to get us our answer. Uh, when we do that, the equation becomes d d tau of g sub r. Now, the second index, nu in the original expression, uh, is summed from 0 to 3 uh, for the gr case, where we have four coordinates, one time, and three spatial coordinates. Uh, but uh, we only need to write the terms where gr, nu variable, is non-zero. And the metric itself is diagonal. Uh, so if one index is a, a little r, uh, the other index has to also be r, or else it vanishes. So the only value of nu that contributes to the sum is when nu is also equal to the r coordinate. So we get g sub r r dx r, which in fact I'll write as just dr. x super r is just the r coordinate, which we also just call r times d tau is equal to 1 half dr. And now we, on the right-hand side, we're summing over lambda and sigma. And lambda and sigma have to have the property that g sub lambda sigma depends on r, or else the first factor will vanish. Uh, and furthermore, g sub lambda sigma has to be non-zero for the values of lambda and sigma you want, which means that lambda and sigma for this case have to be equal to each other, because we have no off-diagonal terms to our metric. So the only contributions we get are from g sub r r and g sub tt. So you get the derivative with respect to r of g sub r r times dr d tau squared. This becomes squared because lambda is equal to sigma. Uh, and then plus 1 half d 
R G sub T T times D T D ta squared. And note that buried in here is, if we expand this, the second derivative of r with respect to time, with respect to ta. So we can extract that and solve for it. And things like dt d ta will appear in our answer initially, because it's here already. Uh, but we could replace dt d ta by this top equation and eliminate it from our result. And I'm going to skip the algebra, which is straightforward, although tedious. I'd urge you to go through it in the notes. Uh, but the end result ends up being remarkably simple after a number of cancellations that look like surprises. And what you find in the end, and it's just the simplification of this formula, nothing more, uh, you find that d squared r d ta squared is just equal to minus Newton's constant times the mass divided by r squared. Now this is rather shocking and even looks exactly like Newtonian mechanics. However, even though it looks like Newtonian mechanics, it's not really the same as Newtonian mechanics. Uh, because the variables don't mean quite the same thing. Um, first of all, even r does not really mean the radius in the same sense as radius is defined by Newton. Uh, in Newtonian mechanics, radius is the distance from the origin. If we wanted to know the distance from the origin, uh, we would have to integrate this metric. And in fact, there isn't even an actual origin here because you have to go through the singularity before you get there, and you really can't. That integral is not real, really even defined. Uh, although, of course, if we had a, something like the sun, where the metric was different from this at small r, then we could integrate from r equals 0. And that would define the true radius distance from the center. But it would not be r. It would be what you got by integrating with the metric. Uh, so r has a different interpretation than it does for Newtonian physics. Uh, might add, it does, still has a simple interpretation. If you look at this metric, uh, the tangential part, the angular part, is exactly what you have for Euclidean geometry. It's just r squared times the same combination of d theta and d phi as appears on the surface of a sphere. Uh, so little r is sometimes called the circumferential radius because it really does give you the circumference of circles at that radial coordinate. If we went around in a circle at a fixed r, the circle would involve varying uh, phi, for example, over a range of 2 pi, we really would see uh, a total circumference of 2 pi little r. Uh, so, so r is related to circumferences in exactly the way as it is in Euclidean geometry, but it's not related to the distance from the origin in the same way as it is in Euclidean geometry. Uh, in addition, tau here is not the universal time that Newton imagined, uh, but rather ta is measured um, along the geodesic. Uh, it is just ds squared, but remember ds squared is being measured along the geodesic, uh, which means that it is, the, in fact, the proper time as it would be measured by the person falling uh, with the object uh, towards the black hole. So ta is proper time as measured by the falling object. Uh, and that follows from what we know about the meaning of the metric itself. OK, that said, uh, we would now like to just study this equation more carefully.
And since the equation itself still has the same form as what you get from Newton, uh, if you remember what you would have done if this was 801, uh, you can, in fact, do exactly the same thing here. Uh, and what you probably would have done if this was 801 uh, would be to recognize that this equation can be uh, integrated. Uh, we can write the equation as d d tau of 1 half d r d tau squared minus g m over r equals 0. If you carry out these derivatives, you get that equation. And this is just the conservation of energy version uh, of the force equation. And that tells us that this quantity is a constant. If we drop the object from some initial position r sub 0, and we drop it with no initial velocity, we just let go of it at r sub 0, uh, that tells us what this quantity is uh, when we drop it. It's minus gm over r sub 0. This piece vanishes if there's no initial velocity. And that means we'll always have that value. And knowing that, we can write dr d tau is equal to, just solving for that, minus the square root of 2gm times r0 minus r over r, r0. I've collected two terms, put them over a common denominator, and added them. Uh, so this is not quite as obvious as it might be. But this is just the statement that that quantity is, has the same value as it did when you started. Now this can be further integrated. Uh, we can write it. as dr over, bringing all this to the other side, is equal to d tau, and then integrate both sides. Notice when I bring this to the other side and bring the, the d tau to the right, everything on the left-hand side now only depends on r. So this is just an explicit integral over r that we can do. And I will just tell you that when the integral is done, uh, we get a formula for tau as a function of r. And it's equal to the square root of r sub 0 over 2gm times r0 times the inverse tangent of the square root of r0 minus r over r plus the square root of r times r0 minus r. So when r equals r0, this gives us 0, and that's what we want. When we, when we start, we're at r0, at time 0, or proper time 0. And then as r gets smaller, as it falls in, uh, time grows. And this gives us the time as a function of r. We might prefer to have r as a function of time, but that formula can't really be inverted analytically. So that's the best we can do. Now, one thing that you notice from this is that nothing special happens 
as r decreases uh, all the way to 0. Uh, even when you plug in r equals 0 here, you just get some finite number. So in a finite amount of time, uh, the observer would find himself falling through the Schwarzschild horizon and all the way to r equals 0. Uh, I didn't mention it, but r equals 0 is a true singularity. Our metric is also singular when r equals 0. Uh, these quantities all become infinite. Uh, and physically what would happen is that as the object falling in approaches r equals 0, the tidal forces, that is the difference in the gravitational force on one part of the object versus another, uh, will get stronger and stronger, uh, and objects will just be ripped apart. And the ripping apart uh, occurs as being spaghettiized. Uh, that is, the force on the front gets to be very strong compared to the force on the back, so objects get stretched out along the direction of motion. Now, the curious thing uh, is what this looks like if we think of it not as a function of the proper time measured by the wristwatch of the object falling in, uh, but rather we could try to describe it in terms of uh, our external time variable, the variable t that appears in the Schwarzschild metric. And to do that, to make the conversion, uh, we want to calculate uh, what dr dt is instead of dr d tau. We'd like to know the analogous formula in terms of t. Uh, and to get that, we use simply chain rule here. dr dt is equal to dr d tau, which we've already calculated, uh, times d tau dt. And d tau dt is 1 over d t d tau. Uh, if you just have two variables that depend on each other, the derivatives are just the inverse of each other. Uh, so this can be written as dr d tau, which we've calculated, uh, divided by dt d tau. And dt d tau we've really already calculated as well, uh, because it's just given by this formula here. So we can write out what that is and figure out how it's going to behave as the object approaches the Schwarzschild radius. So it becomes dr dt is equal to, I'll just write the numerator as dr d tau, given by that expression. Uh, but what's behaved in a more peculiar way is the denominator, which is h inverse of r plus c to the minus 2 h to the minus 2 of r times dr d tau squared. So now we want to look at this function h inverse of r. And this just means 1 over h of r. It doesn't mean functional inverse. Uh, that is just equal to r over r minus r Schwarzschild. And we're going to be interested in what happens when r gets to be very near r Schwarzschild because that's where the interesting things happen as you're approaching the Schwarzschild horizon. Uh, and that means that the behavior of the numerator won't be important. The denominator will be blowing up, and that's what will control everything. Uh, so we can approximate this as just r Schwarzschild over r minus r Schwarzschild. And this is for r near r Schwarzschild. Right, we can replace the numerator by a constant. And then if we look at this formula, this is going to blow up as we approach the horizon. This is the square of that quantity. It will blow up faster than the first power of that quantity. And therefore, this will dominate the, the, the denominator of the expression. We can ignore this. 
Uh, when this dominates, the dr d tau pieces cancel. So that's nice. We don't even need to think about what the r d tau is. Uh, and what we get near the horizon is simply a factor of c times r minus r Schwarzschild over r Schwarzschild. It's basically just h. This becomes upstairs with a plus sign, and the square root turns it into h instead of h squared. So this is just the inverse of that. OK, now if we try to play the same game here as we did here to determine what, how the time variable behaves as a function of r instead of the proper time variable tau, what we find is that t of r, and this is for r near r Schwarzschild, is about equal to minus r sub s over c times the integral uh, up to r of dr prime over r prime minus rs. This is dr dt. Yeah, this was dr dt from the beginning. I forgot to write the r somehow. Uh, the integral, yeah, I didn't write the lower limit of integration. I was about to comment on that. The integrand that we're writing is only a good approximation when we're near r. Uh, so whatever happens near the lower limit of integration, we just haven't done accurately. So I'm going to just not write a lower limit of integration here, meaning that we're interested only in what happens as the upper limit of integration r becomes very near r Schwarzschild, and everything will be dominated by what happens near the upper limit of integration. That's right. That's right. We just integrate over a small region near near our Schwarzschild. also about equal to R Schwarzschild. And the point is that this diverges logarithmically as R approaches R Schwarzschild. So it behaves approximately as minus R Schwarzschild over C times the logarithm of R minus R Schwarzschild. So as r approaches r Schwarzschild, this quantity, that's the argument of the logarithm, gets closer and closer to 0. It gets smaller and smaller, approaching 0. Um, the logarithm of a very small number is a negative number, a large negative number. And then there's a minus sign here. You get a large positive number. And it diverges. As r approaches r Schwarzschild, the time variable approaches infinity. And that means at no finite time uh, does the object ever reach the Schwarzschild horizon. But as seen from the outside, it takes an infinite amount of time for the object to reach the Schwarzschild horizon. Uh, as time gets larger and larger, the object gets closer and closer to the Schwarzschild horizon, uh, asymptotically approaching it, uh, but never reaching it. Uh, so this, of course, is very peculiar, because from the point of view of uh, the person falling into the black hole, all of this just happens in a finite amount of time and is over with. Uh, from the outside, it looks like it takes an infinite amount of time. And weird things like this can happen because of the fact that, in general relativity, time is a locally measured variable. Uh, you measure your time, I measure my time. They don't have to agree. And in this case, they can disagree by an infinite amount, uh, which is rather bizarre. Uh, but that's what happens. <laughs> 
So according to classical general relativity, uh, when an object falls into a black hole, uh, from the point of view of the object, uh, nothing special would happen as that object crossed the Schwarzschild horizon. Um, everybody believed that that was really the case until maybe a couple years ago. Now, that, now it's controversial, actually. Uh, at the classical level, everybody believes that's still true. I mean, this is classical general relativity says that an object can fall through the Schwarzschild horizon and nothing happens. It's not really a singularity. Um, but the issue is that when one incorporates or attempts to incorporate the effects of quantum theory, which nobody really knows how to do in a totally reliable way, uh, then there are indications uh, that there's something dramatic happening at the Schwarzschild horizon. Uh, the phrase that's often used for what people think might be happening at the horizon is, is the word firewall. Um, so whether or not there's a firewall at the horizon uh, is not settled at this point. Certainly, though, classical general relativity does not predict the firewall. Uh, if it exists, all the arguments that say it might exist are, are based on the quantum physics of black holes and black hole evaporation and things like that. Uh, as you know, quantum mechanically, black holes are not stable either. They evaporate, uh, as was derived by Stephen Hawking in, I think, 1974. Um, but that's strictly a quantum effect. It would go to zero as h-bar goes to zero. Uh, and at the moment, we're only talking about classical general relativity. So the black hole that we're describing is perfectly stable, and nothing happens if you fall through the horizon, except from the outside, it looks like it would take an infinite amount of time just to reach the horizon. Uh, so we'll stop there. I guess I'm not going to get to talk about uh, the uh, uh, energy associated with radiation, but we'll get to that on Thursday. So see you folks on Thursday.